kind of question, including the amount. I, I know she spent hours with my own uh, constituents who she, uh, Rosa, sp spent time with each of them on the phone when they had their own questions. So I think this is really a case of a team of people who did their homework uh, and who did all the work that's required to get to get us to this place. So uh, it's really just a moment of appreciation, and I hope that, um, as Chair Atkins said, you know, when it goes to the voters, that all those questions get answered, and uh, and and that the, the work continues. So it's my pleasure to support this motion. And thank you, by the way. Sorry, sorry. Thank you also to um, Chair Narvaez for really for putting it on the agenda as many times as it took to exhaust our questions as well. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's an exciting day. We've got to that we've we've got to finally be here. Um, as a city, we decided a long time ago, before any of us were sitting at this horseshoe today that we were going to get into the convention business. So that decision was made for us before we ever got here. Um, and as a city, we've been in that business for decades. We have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in this convention center, and we've invested hundreds of hours, millions of hours of staff time, I assume, um, in supporting it. So we've made that decision to be in the convention center business. And just like in any business you're in, whether you're in a small business like me or a large corporation like some of the folks probably watching us today, um, you've got to continue to invest in your business or you're going to fail. And this is a huge step today for us to invest economically in a tool that's going to, we've seen the data, we've seen the facts that show that it will support um, increased economic development in our downtown and in our city. Um, it's not just the first step in continuing the economic development around the convention center. Today is also a very important step for our city to start the essential discussions on the land use, on the transportation element, and on the urban planning that is going to go into this downtown area. And that's what I'm very excited about. You know, I appreciate the comments that were made today, particularly DDI, when they pointed out that um, Options 3C supports the Downtown 360 plan. That's one of the most successful plans we have in this city because of the public-private partnership between the city and uh, this private entity, DDI. Um, it, when the city tries to do plans on, it own, on its own, we don't very, do very well. It doesn't last. It gets shelved a lot of times. Not always, but most of the time. But in these public-private endeavors, when we work together, um, we see success. And Downtown 360 is one of the most successful plans and because we're following it, DDI is hammering it, making sure we're, do it, we're doing it. And this is the plan chosen by the many entities that went into putting the Downtown 360 plan together. And why is that? Uh, it's because of the connecting of neighborhoods. Uh, 3C option also bridges the gap to the south. Um, it creates walkability and it encourages uh, placemaking. All very important things for urban planning. One piece that I don't want to miss uh, talking about today is um, the importance of housing. I think Chairman Narvaez mentioned this, and I, I believe one of my other colleagues as well. Um, we are, I just confirmed with Ms. Fleming that we have at least 10,000 new projected permanent jobs will come out of um, this, this new renovation. And that's, uh, I guess, an estimate based on like hotels and all the new things that are going to be opening up down there. But 10,000 new jobs, a lot of them will need workforce housing. And if we as a city do not take it seriously to make sure there is mixed income housing, both market rate and affordable housing, um, around this newly opened up development area, shame on us. So we talked about this last week. I'm not going to belabor the point with, with Ms. Tolbert over there, but I, I hope that staff has listened to us last week and are continuing to listen to us when we say, make sure you put some housing into this development area. Last, I, I'll just do what Chairman uh, Schultz did. I want to make sure I, I thank everyone, and I won't go into the laundry list because I'll miss some folks, but definitely Chairman Narvaez for 
uh, tolerating my questions, even though I'm not even on the committee. Uh, I was at all of his meetings as well. Uh, like most of my colleagues, uh, Visit Dallas has been carrying a lot of the, uh, the torch here uh, along the way, to use the uh, Olympics term, since that's going on right now. Our consultant's done a great job on this. And, um, and then, of course, the city attorney's office, I know, has been very involved as well. Um, and then lastly, uh, Rosa Fleming and her team. Um, I mean, this is the amount of questions, the amount of, of detailed answers they provided us. If anybody ever wants to see them, you'll be reading all night and, and probably the next night, too. It's, they, they did the work, and, the, and, the, and, and they really made sure we got our questions answered, and they did a fabulous job. Thank you. I proudly support the, uh, the motion. Chairman Basil Dewey, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm uh, also proud to support this motion. I think this is a really exciting day. I want to thank uh, Chairman Narvaez for your leadership um, for this monumentous uh, day. Um, we, we have an opportunity to, to really change aesthetically um, a part of downtown Dallas uh, that is, in theory, for tourism. Um, but I believe that it, in um, turn, is going to serve as a huge asset for the, the city of Dallas. It's going to contribute to our tax space. It's going to provide more jobs uh, in, in multiple industries. It's going to connect neighborhoods, as has been uh, mentioned. Um, and it, just as also been mentioned, it, this, is, this is really speaking to equity, what we always talk about, what we always say that we have to put our money where our mouth is. And when we're looking at a project that uh, at this magnitude and we're looking at uh, the work that was put into um, getting the Texas legislature to uh, amend a bill to allow for this to, to, to happen, but not only for, al for allowing this to, to happen, but also getting with the lobbyists of the um, hotel industry and, and emphasizing the need for the equity component and the fact that, that money and investment for Fair Park is attached to this speaks volumes to that notion of equity, speaks volumes to what we often say here. And we're saying that we want to bring more development to the Central Business District. We want to provide something new and shiny. And some people may call it a vanity project. Some people may call it, you know, what they want to call it. But the truth of the matter is, is that something associated with it is also bringing in growth and development and revitalization to our southern sector of the city. And that's exactly what we have vowed to do as a body. Um, so I see this as nothing but a win all around. This is a win for our tourists. This is a win for Dallasites. This is a win for our business community. This is a win for the downtown Dallas residents, but this is also a win for our southern Dallas residents. And um, overall, uh, this is, is something that I look forward to uh, celebrating and, and seeing evolve, um, just as we've seen downtown Dallas evolve over the past decade. Uh, this is going to be one of those game changers to, to a catalyst. So I also will thank um, many people. Uh, I, I want to thank, of course, down at the legislature, the uh, representatives who helped make this happen, and Chia, um, Representative Crockett, um, uh, Chairwoman uh, Button, and uh, also Senator West, um, for all of the advocacy and work uh, and spearheading leadership that you, you guys did in Austin. Uh, thank y'all. It's huge for the city. That's why we have a dele delegation down there fighting for us. Um, also, former Park Board President um, Calvert Collins Braden, she was uh, with me actually when I got to testify. It was my first time testifying down in Austin, so it was it was an awesome memory to to um, have. Uh, it was a successful um, testifying <laughs> job. Um, but uh, there was a lot of work that was put in Fair Park First Spectra. Um, Visit Dallas, and of course, just has been mentioned, Rosa Fleming, your patience through the process, I, I, that's one thing that I definitely think, think needs to be applauded, um, your professionalism and, um, and your leadership to get this to where we are today um, has been second to none, and I believe that's why we are here. So uh, thank you for your work and dedication to our city, and I'm looking forward to this project. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Willis, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mayor. So I want to push on a couple of comments that I've heard made, and one is about uh, this being a no-brainer. And I think that, you know, as a freshman, I don't look at anything as a no-brainer. 
So uh, even though I love other people's money, and by that I mean getting people who are outside the city of Dallas to come in and help fund some of the things that will make our city even stronger. But when I look back to educate myself as a freshman of this body, um, a master plan was done in 2017. Rosa first briefed it in 2019. Uh, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee looked at this August 17th of 2020 and again on December 8th. And then on January 27th of 2021, the council uh, authorized the current uh, consultant to develop the, the plan that we're looking at many of the concepts of today. Then when our, you know, me and three other colleagues joined, that's when we began to be able to be briefed on this. And it's actually been on two committees of which I serve on both of them. So um, EcoDev, uh, we looked at this uh, uh, in, uh, on October 4th of this year. And then uh, also at transportation, it was on December 7th and January 18th. And then finally, this body looked at this a week ago. So uh, to the point made, yes, um, you know, CCAP, don't tell them about all the paper and trees that we, <laughs> we've killed and getting all of these memos printed, but the depth of information has really been visitors as well. Uh, not to mention our weather and some other attributes that we've got. We've recently stood up an economic development corporation. We're in work on that. And so one of the things we'll be doing is looking at what are the things that Dallas has to offer to lure business here. We've got a collection of things uh, that, that lure business here, a lot of business. And so uh, when you look at this, it's, it seems like a very good decision. It gives us an opportunity to face our issues with transportation from our wonderful airports. Uh, looking at land use, as Mayor Pro Tem West uh, examined. So it makes sense, but it also pushes us to address some of these problems along the way and make it more connective and make it make more sense as a whole versus a building. So I sit on the Visit Dallas board, and I've come to know the industry professionals that we've, we've got working on this. Of course, they're excited about it, but what they're telling me makes a lot of sense. It makes a great business case for Dallas, Texas. It also is something that our residents will be able to utilize and enjoy. And the idea of having walkability from the Cedars all the way over to the AAC and really stitching the fabric together makes a lot of sense. So uh, I am supportive of 3C. I am a little concerned uh, that there is some confusion with our taxpayers. They may see the shiny new object and think, oh gosh, you know, I don't, I don't want to pay for this. I've got potholes and streets and alleys to deal with. So Ms. Rach, I was going to see if you might explain revenue bonds and, and this stream of income and where this comes from because we're at a pivotal moment and it's a big decision, but I think that there, there's, there can be some misperception. So I'd love it if you would clear that up. Certainly. Uh, Elizabeth Rage, Chief Financial Officer, and I first want to say that I'm here in person today, which is unusual for me, um, and I'm doing that because I didn't want there to be any difficulty hearing me or any transmission issues because this is such a critical issue that we get it right and we don't have misinformation out there for our taxpayers. So thank you for the question. I appreciate it. A revenue bond is a bond that is backed by a specific stream of revenue. In the case of this project, it would be backed by hotel occupancy tax, including the additional tax collected because of the Brimer bill. It could also be backed by other revenues that are pledged to the convention center, uh, such as alcoholic beverage tax and uh, convention center revenues. However, um, in our financial planning for this thus far, we've really only looked at that state money and the hotel occupancy tax. So the PFZ, the HOT, and the Brimer bill tax. And so um, in looking at those, what we have found is that at this point, with what we know, it's within the realm. This project fund is within the realm of what we will be able to finance with those revenues. We will not need to use other revenues, including the revenues of the convention center. So those revenues are preserved for that ongoing maintenance and operation of the convention center and wouldn't be pledged at this point in what we're looking at to the debt. On the debt, the bottom line on, the, on this project is that we need to go forward. We need to be able to get some cost estimates. Then we need to put the financing together. We're not talking about a bond issuance until November of 2023. And at that time, of course, things may have changed. We've got interest rate changes, 
possible and, um, of course, much to work through. So it's premature to uh, come out with any particular financing. Um, and we've not really gotten creative yet. There are some things we can do to make this project work and to get the project fund we need to support uh, the convention center, but also, importantly, to support our jewel, our asset, Fair Park. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate you being here to stop the dropout from Wi-Fi. <laughs> Um, so when I drive into City Hall every day, I pass this big block uh, between in the middle of our community. And I, I just, now when I drive by, I see that big gray block and I see the promise and the hope for stitching our community together. So uh, I am supportive of getting rid of Frankenstein and in, um, in supporting building a new convention center. Thank you very much. Mr. Ridley, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, too, will support this motion and this item. This is the right thing to do for Dallas. It's an investment in our future that will pay dividends for decades to come. But we also must focus on the need to preserve this facility through the necessary maintenance provision so that it doesn't end up deteriorating like our current facility has with hundreds of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance. We don't want to jeopardize this major investment and uh, in this important asset without making provision for a funding source for uh, maintaining this uh, facility in a class one status so that it continues to draw people to Dallas. I was heartened by Ms. Rach's comment that uh, revenues from the actual operation of the convention center uh, could be utilized for that purpose, for maintenance. And uh, I think we all must commit the city to providing for the allocation of that revenue stream for adequate maintenance for the facility. Uh, I have another question for staff, and that is that uh, I'd like you to confirm that this uh, item also authorizes the expenditure of $40 million for the schematic design by WSP. That is something that I think the residents of Dallas also needs to know is part of this uh, item. And my question is, where will that money come from, as it will obviously be uh, incurred before we sell any revenue bonds? This is Rosa Flum, Director of Convention and Event Services, and we're currently looking at the proposal that was submitted. So we were, um, we're vetting it and waiting until we have a uh, council policy decision in order to make sure and verify that uh, cost, so which was estimated at about 2% of the overall project cost. So we have the funds. It should be paid over a course of a year and a half. They are in our capital fund at the convention center. And we understood when we started planning this project that the 30% design would come before the bond sale. And so can you confirm that that anticipated cost is $40 million? I can't confirm the actual cost because we can't begin the negotiation for that supplemental agreement until we have a policy decision that allows us to move forward it's, it's in the range, but I'm not sure that that will ultimately be the cost. So will that item come back for um, approval by the council once that contract is negotiated? Yes, it will. It will come back um, either February 23rd if we're able to get everything done with the attorneys by then, or we'll take it on March 9th. Okay, so apparently I'm getting it conflicting signals from staff. This action today on this item 32 does not authorize the expenditure of $40 million for the schematic design. Is that not correct? It authorizes us to be able to move forward and vet the proposal. It does not authorize the actual expenditure. You would authorize the actual expenditure um, either on February 23rd or March 9th when I bring it back to council. I'd also like clarification on the status of the existing convention center after construction of the new facility, if it is approved today. 
Uh, in the briefing that we received last week, it indicated that it would be demolished and replaced with private development on the land it sits on. And yet yesterday, staff informed me that no, it would not be demolished. It could be used for other city purposes. And this came up in the context of my question, which was whether the cost estimate for the new facility included the cost of demolishing the old facility. And I was informed that it did not because it would not be demolished. Can you clarify what the plans are or when the uh, ultimate uh, future of that facility will be decided? So that's, that's not, I think there was maybe some confusion. I'm not sure which staff you were speaking with. But the um, T-ball and location as well as the memorial arena in this concept always remain mm -hmm. there are portions of this current construction um, in the area of d e and f that uh, may remain preference would be only e and f um, with a connection to the omni remaining as well but reoriented so the remainder of it would have to be uh, torn down so that would leave that's where we get the number for the 23 available acres for development and I see that Majid has come on the screen so I want to see if he has additional comments that he would like to make um, honorable mayor and, and council members uh, Rosa is correct I think uh, uh, partially the the convention center would be demolished to uh, take place for the new uh, facility but um, some of the um, some of the existing uh, facilities will continue to operate as usual. So that would be exhibit halls D, E, and F. Th that would be correct. Yes, sir. as we. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Arnold, you recognize five minutes. Thank you. I just want to be very brief, but to voice my support as I have done in the past. But for clarification for, for those that I represent, could you, Ms. Rosa, give me, uh, and you don't have to do that, just provide me the information regarding your planning with uh, Dallas Police Department and any of our first responders and fire department as well as we move forward uh, with this particular proposal. I know the chair uh, talked about, a few minutes ago talked about public safety and of course, when we have patrons to come to the city, to come to conventions, they want to know that they are safe and there's no doubt about it. So uh, if you could give me feedback on how you've been working with uh, DPD, I would appreciate it. And, and of course, fire. So we're just calling my first responders. The second piece, I think, as we talk about, uh, you know, I keep talking about Google ability, and that's the same to me in terms of connectivity. Uh, being able to locate places. I love when I go to a convention that I have so many options and just I don't know what to do. But the, I heard you talk about, I heard some of the comments about the connectivity to the south, the southern sector. So could we kind of talk a little bit about where, you talk, where your point of reference is going south? Because as I try to sell this to the voters, I want to be sure that we're talking about areas that need uh, to be included as we do the connectivity and we expand and you know when folks come to town sometimes they want some good old soul food and I want to make sure that if they google it up they can get to Rekka's barbecue you know I want to make sure if they want to know a little bit more about African American culture yes they're going to stop by T-Ball maybe and go to a play or a presentation but I also want them to go to Pan African Cultural Center so to help us to understand when you talk about South wh where are you going? Sure, um, I can answer that question. So as we open up and we open up Lamar and Griffin, you naturally start to open up uh, the connectivity of downtown to the Cedars, which is also effectively a portion of South Dallas. We'll continue on. That'll open up the growth and economic development along that corridor into South Dallas proper. 
And then you should see the effect of the changes and updates at Fair Park, assuming that Brimer um, is approved by this by this body and then approved by citizens in, in an election, you'll see the improvements to Fair Park begin to spread out in the community. So it's a kind of a bookend effect of both projects working together to spur development from the south and then connect into downtown. All right. So when we talk and I we'll hope that answers your question. Thank you. So as I keep put giving some input and we I think the city of the Mayor Pro Tem talked about land use and just some planning. I know I want to be a part of that conversation to continue on because there's confusion about South Dallas and the southern sector. And so when we talk about parks and a deck park, you know, we do have a, a park in, 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 the, in, in District 4 and District uh, 1 where going down, coming to the southern sector, the core, we want to make sure that when they get on, uh, when you start connecting around the bullet train and all the growth happens, you can come on down the Corinth Street Bridge and we can see development coming across uh, to the gateway of the core, uh, in this case of District 4. But we must have an understanding uh, as with the intention of growth. And so we're not continuously put on uh, that plan of you all have to wait. Just wait. That's all I've heard since I've gotten in 2015. Now, you all just be good little constituents, and you just wait because it's coming in the core of, south, of, of, south, of, of the southern sector. So I, I want to applaud you. I'm very excited about uh, the plan, it's wholeheartedly support it, and would ask everyone around the horseshoe today as we celebrate even African American Heritage Month, uh, we have an anthem that says lift every voice and sing, so I want you to lift every voice and vote today for this convention center. So, uh, and the plans that we have. But I want to make sure when I'm out here with the constituents, they understand the flow and the intention, even if I'm not on the council, perhaps we pass the baton to those who will be here, that there's a commitment to expand this well. Thank you all, but I think we must get about the business today of voting to support and get an understanding of how we will go out and market and, and being able to share the truth about this particular plan and the impact. Thank you. Chairwoman Mendelson, you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, I move to amend the motion to replace the 30% design with a 10% design and have this item brought back to council for consideration with an independent cost analysis of the project. Sorry, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion, Ms. Mendelson? Thank you. You have five minutes on your motion. Thank you. Um, this would allow this item to move forward probably unanimously if that's important to people. We've had two briefings in transportation, one full briefing, and I've used all my time at those meetings to ask questions. In total, it's a $4 billion project, and I don't believe we have the depth of information or the deep understanding we need for all of what we're voting on. Because I've already said a lot on it, I'm just gonna go ahead and list my reasons why I think we need to do this. One is we really don't know what's gonna happen in the future with conventions. COVID's changed travel, it's changed the workplace, it's changed entertainment. Convention centers across America weren't growing before COVID, and now they're in a completely different situation. Cities are adding convention centers, including the square footage um, in existing ones, and what's happening is we're gonna compete with this brand new facility and possibly only get what we already have. So with that, the second item would be because we haven't considered all the other uses that could be incorporated in this land and how it could connect with other parts of downtown and adjoining areas. We never did the imagination sessions with council or with the public that should have occurred. We have number three. We've shown a deck park over I-30, but we don't have approval from TxDOT to do such a thing. There's no standards for responsibility if there's an accident, and I don't understand how we can move forward with a 30% design element that's so critical to this project when we don't even know if TxDOT would allow it and what those terms would be. Number four, there's no agreement with Union Pacific Railroad. We need to slow down and make sure we understand what those parameters are. Number five, there's no agreement about the financial participation of the wealthy adjacent landowners who stand to gain unbelievably from this deal. They need to not just be beneficiaries of a city council vote, but also participants in risk and capital. Six, 
Nobody on staff has adequately explained how a building with the oldest section, only 65 years old, and the majority of the building, 50 years old, is so poorly maintained as to present an, as obsolete with a need for 500 to $700 million in repair. How does our budget function with only $9 million allocated to maintain and repair the building when clearly so much more is needed? The under-budgeting of maintenance over decades has caused this building to greatly hasten its usable life, and we still have approximately $200 million in debt on it. I want to know, and the taxpayers deserve to know, how did that happen, and how do we know it won't happen again? Number seven, we don't know the cost. The staff and consultant have pointed repeatedly to Nashville. Nashville set a maximum budget of $585 million. But Dallas, we can't go for $585 billion million because we are the big D, the big D in debt. And we're talking about $2 billion for this convention center with a $4 billion deal, and we need much greater clarity on the exact finances of this project. Limiting the approval to a 10% design will let us see what the real design is and some less hypothetical financial estimates. Number eight, we really don't know the economic benefit that it will provide for us. I'm going to skip over and go to number nine. I'm concerned about staff's ability to deliver on this project. It's a giant project. We've had some pretty significant shuffling of senior management just recently. In the 2017 report, five senior managers overlooked this. Only two of those are still even here today. Number 10, by allowing new hotel development, we're putting at risk our own Omni Hotel making it the oldest hotel option in which taxpayers still owe approximately $400 million. There are currently hotels downtown, and we haven't really heard how we're going to link to them, like the Sheraton, like the Hyatt Regency, and like the Fairmont. We haven't had a discussion about the Veriport. We haven't had a discussion about the Police Memorial. We haven't talked about moving the D2 alignment from Commerce to Young so that it runs outside our convention center. There's rumors of Texas possibly legalizing gambling and an operator possibly putting a casino on this spot. And we haven't paused to figure out what that design would look like if it would be incorporated. There's rumors of the Mavericks possibly wanting to move their arena. Would that go here? Could it go here? There's already items in the press that that's a possibility. But again, we need to pause enough to understand what the full design is. We've talked in passing about the cemetery and outdoor components, but those haven't been flushed out, and there's some real legal implications. Number 17 is everyone wants to say this is going to spur economic development, and that's exactly what was said every single time a city council in Dallas passed to add on to this convention center. And you know what? It never happened. Not once. So I really need to understand how will this be different. My time's up now. I would like to have my next three minutes, and I'll continue my list. Thank you. Chairman Atkins, you're recognized for five minutes on Ms. Mendelson's motion. I am kind of have a blank. You know, Mitch Rosensky was a council member on this deal. He always said, let me look into my crystal ball. And we can look into the crystal ball in the future, but we know what the future is going to be because we don't have a crystal ball. Well, we listen to staff, we listen to recommendation. We also listen to the corporation, corporate America. When we had corporation would not come to downtown Dallas because they said, what are the citizens gonna do? And we raised over $200 million from the private sector to call, cause the art district. Now we got corporation moving downtown which were dead downtown. Again, do we have a crystal ball? No, we do not have a crystal ball. But we are smart, intelligent colleagues around here. We done did our due diligence. We done asked all the hard questions. Staff done gave us the answers. It's our responsibility to send it forward. If there are one council member, two council members, three council members, four council members, agree or disagree, no the majority count. I learned a long time, learned how to count to eight. When we got eight around this horseshoe, we're going to do the right thing for the city of Dallas. Did we look at a crystal ball when we decided to build the American Airlines Center? How are we going to pay for it? Did we look at it 
when we build the two bridges to nowhere, how are we going to pay for it? Did we look at the cross bar then? How are we going to build it? Did we look at the cross bar when we build it on the hotel? How are we going to pay for it? Did we thought through that cross bar we got four restaurants from the, um, the hotel? We did not sunset the tip of the American Airlines Center because we got more money to develop Dallas. We are a can do city. I've been here for 16 years, public service. I done seen the North and the South, the tell the two cities. Now we got an opportunity to grow one city, one Dallas, as America said, one Dallas. North, South, East, West. We're going to grow the city. I don't believe one person around here is going to stop the growth because we're going to send it to the taxpayer. And the taxpayer is the one who's going to make the decision what we're going to do. So it's our job is to listen to staff. If we do not have a city manager, we do not have anything, no staff. The staff don't answer the question. They don't answer the question. And economic development, majority of the staff is gone, but we still got to run the city. We still got to make a decision. It's our responsibility to make a decision. That's why we got elected, to make a decision for the voters. If we cannot make a decision for the vote, we should not be sitting around this hardship. But we need to. I'm going to have to ask you, ma'am, to refrain from applauding. Thank you. Okay. But we need. No, thank you. <laughs> I can understand how you could get confused about that sometimes in here with uh, not Chairman Atkins going on. But it, it, we, we it, do it, need to, the audience to, to refrain from responding. So thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Murray. Uh, this is not Pastor Atkins, this is Tennell Atkins. My son is a pastor, this is Tennell Atkins speaking. But thank you. Thank you. But, but we talk about the Cowboys. You know, we say, okay, great. The Cowboys went to Arlington. But we could have kept the Cowboys here. You know, but, you know, there was a crystal ball, you know. And, and, and I keep, keep hearing economic development, the core. If we don't grow the core, of the city, which the core is downtown. We can't grow the city. And we got to stand up and we got to do our due diligence and we got to ask the hard question. If staff can't give you the question, you still ask the question. As Chairman Omar said, one, two, three committees. It came to economic development. And we are the engine that makes sure we got public safety to get stuff done here. So do we need to go to quarter of life? Do we need to go back to public safety? Are we going to keep moving in and kick the can down the road? Or oh, will this Browner bill be here tomorrow? You know, we got to make a decision. We got to send it to the vote. We own a timeline. Chairman Babaduda went down there and got it in the legislature, the bill. That bill don't stay there forever. We got an opportunity to get some money from the state to build a convention hotel, but also develop Fair Park. Fair Park, a jewel revenue asset to the city. We got an opportunity to find out, not looking in the accounts, not trying to find the money, but we got an opportunity to have some free money to improve Fair Park. And we're going to turn that money away. Let's move forward. Let's get it done. If you don't want to be running a horseshoe, make the hard decision. Sometimes you cannot look into that crystal ball. You just got to do it. Mayor Pro Tem, you have five minutes on Ms. Mendelson's motion. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to get, give Rosa an opportunity um, to clarify on what does occur during the 30% design phase because the, uh, the amendment is for us to pull this back to a 10% design phase. The original motion was for 30%. So what will occur over, let's say, the next year in the 30% design phase? Some of the concerns that were brought up were on land use planning, transportation, working with TxDOT. Will that happen in the 30% design phase? Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. The 30% uh, design phase is a year-long process. 
and during that process, there's a lot of public input. There is that look at land use and transportation and the integration. There's also opportunity to continue our discussions that we have already been having with TxDOT and COG and the other, or North Central Texas Council of Governments and other entities that are involved in the process. So part of that is making sure that by October or September, we have uh, a document that we can share with the public as part of the proposed primer education process. And there'll be several touch points with the council, those visioning objectives that uh, were mentioned, as well as opportunities to look at what will sit where, how to integrate housing, how to integrate retail and all of that are all part of that initial uh, design. Okay, so unless we, we move forward with this phase, like we're going to be sort of, I'm hearing that we're going to be sort of treading water, not able to open the door to really make meaningful land use discussions, meaningful discussions about incorporation of, of um, Union Pacific and the train, uh, the, the high speed rail. Like this needs to happen in order to keep those discussions going. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, sir. And so part of that is it, these are bridging documents is what they're called. And so they bridge the project vision so that when we do the procurement for the actual design and construction, they know how to move forward with the, with the council's policy decision and the direction and vision that the city wants to take the whole project. Is it possible that these um, uh, other entities, and I'm talking about the, you know, RTC, the Regional Transportation Council, um, I mean, the state of Texas, TxDOT, would not really take us seriously that we want to move forward with this if we reduce this back to a 10% plan and therefore not engage in serious discussions with us? I think so. I think that it starts to uh, defray and delay the actual project. Um, and I, we've had these discussions, some of these uh, comments about not having spoken to uh, North Central Council of Governments, North Central Texas Council of Governments, and TxDOT uh, are probably mis, mis, uh, misstatements in that we have been meeting with them. We've met several times. We've had individual meetings with some of them just to make sure that we're moving forward. They, they have questions, some of which will be answered during this 30% uh, design, but we've not... Uh, it would cause a, a delay to the to the project and to the to the timeline that we have for construction, but we obviously uh, defer to you all as the policymakers. Thank you. No more questions. Mr. Ridley, you recognize for five minutes on Ms. Mills's motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Rosa. Um, would staff agree to provide at least quarterly updates to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee about the progress of the design process by the consultant and uh, including input about negotiations with TxDOT, uh, with Union Pacific Railway uh, to identify any roadblocks that may come up uh, before reaching that ultimate 30% schematic design completion? Yes, sir. Thanks for the question. So, yes, I've actually asked the uh, team if we could have monthly updates. I feel like those touch points are crucially important. The involvement that you all have, have done as we move forward through the committees has been um, amazing and uh, appreciative by staff. The questions help us move the project forward in a positive way. And so I have asked the consultants to do a monthly touch in and I would love to be able to, to update council through um, our, obviously our city leadership um, monthly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chairman, Ar Chairman Arvaj, you recognize for five minutes on Ms. Mendelson's motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm gonna remind everybody that why this item was in transportation and infrastructure. It made the most sense. Serving on the committee is the chair of quality of life, the chair of economic development, the chair of GPFM, 
the Chair of Transportation and Infrastructure, as well as the Chair of Workforce Education and Equity. Five of the eight chairs that serve this city serve on this committee. This committee is the most well-rounded of all the committees because we have representation from the north, the west, the south, and the east, and the center. By, delaying, you, by going with this delay tactic, what it will do is cause staff to have to roll back. We're not going to be seen seriously by any of the other entities. What folks may not understand is that we're not in design phase at this point. We're just telling staff, this is the one we want you to go forward with. Start designing. Start bringing us back what you think. That way staff can come back and all the questions that have been asked that we're not into, because we're not at the point of where certain memorials are going to be long and where um, certain things are going to be. That's not part of what we're doing today. And that's the focus that we have to remember, colleagues, is that we're on today. And the 30% design, Michael Morris from the RTC, which I proudly serve on, has already told us in public that he will be working on this with us in order to get the deck parks and the other things that we need in order to work with our other governmental agencies like TxDOT. We have to make sure that we show that we are serious. And that's why a 30% design is necessary because if we don't, we're just costing more money, we're costing more to have to be done when all of these questions when it comes to design get to be asked. And my colleague, my esteemed colleague from District 14 just asked about quarterly updates. Absolutely. There's no reason. This is not something that we start with today and then we just forget about and throw on a shelf and wait until right before an election and say, let's, you know, throw it up there. We're going to have to probably have even more than quarterly updates on this item, Mr. Mayor, because we're talking about billions and billions of dollars and a transformation isn't just three committee meetings and a briefing and we're done. This is literally talking about which of the design options that we liked and wanted to go forward. So I will not be in favor of the Mendelssohn Amendment to change all the hard work that has been done over countless months and years by the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and all these other committees that were mentioned earlier today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now, I just want to make sure everybody knows I'm not trying to um, stifle debate, but we are trying to get downstairs to the lobby for the Juanita Craft ceremony as soon as we can. So we're going to try to avoid being duplicative and remember procedurally that we are on Ms. Mendelssohn's motion. And if that motion, if it's not withdrawn and we vote on it, if it passes, it, it modifies the original one and we're voting on that. And if it fails, we're going back to the original motion. So you'll still have an opportunity to speak in your 531 on the original motion. So you do not need to speak twice. So I'm just making sure everybody understands that. So um, before I go to Ms. Mendelson, Mr. Basil Dua, you're recognized for five minutes on Ms. Mendelson's motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to call the question on the series. I didn't hear what you said. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, we need a record vote as opposed to make sure we have the. T it's a two thirds vote. Mr. Is it two thirds? Non debatable, non amendable. Right. It's to the entire series as well of the pending motions, is what I heard. So that would be the amendment and the other pending main motion. So debate would stop on both. You would immediately vote on the current amendment and then down to the main, amend main okay. motion. So. Um, I mean, I could do a voice vote or we could do a record, record vote. Record vote, please. We'll, we'll do a record vote. This is to call the question. Important. And can you clarify that what she said, that we would then be voting on both amendments? The motion, to make sure I heard Tammy correctly, she's saying that the motion, as Mr. Basildua made it, was a motion to call the question on both the amendment and the underlying motion. If this motion prevails, then we will immediately vote on your motion and then immediately vote on the underlying motion. In other words, this is going to end the debate. This is going to cut the debate short. So we're in the middle of the vote now. So go with this on the motion to call the question on both items. Please continue voting. 13 have voted. All 15 have voted. Voting in favor, Council Members Basildua, McGue, 
Arnold, Thomas, wow. Mayor Pro Tem West, Councilmember Willis, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Resendez, Councilmembers Narvaez, Ridley, Blackman, Atkins, voting against, Councilmembers Mendelson, Mayor Johnson, Councilmember Schultz, and Councilmember Moreno, with 11 voting in favor, four opposed, the motion passes, or the question passes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so that means we are now going to vote immediately on Ms. Mendelson's uh, amendment. So, a record vote has been requested. Secretary. Please start voting. 14 have voted. All 15 have voted. Point of clarification on what we're voting on. Okay. We're voting on Ms. Mendelssohn's motion, her amendment. Okay. All 15 have voted. Voting in favor, Councilmember Mendelssohn. Voting against, Councilmembers Basil Dua, McGugh, Arnold, Thomas, Mayor Pro Tem West, Mayor Johnson, Councilmember Willits, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Resendez, Councilmember Schultz, Moreno, Narvaez, Ridley, Blackman, and Atkins with one voting in favor, 14 opposed. The motion fails, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Now we go on to the main motion. Another record vote's been requested, Madam Secretary. Please start voting. 14 have voted, 15 have voted. Voting in favor, Council Members Basil Dua, McHugh, Arnold, Thomas, Mayor Pro Tem West, Mayor Johnson, Council Member Willis, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Resendez, Council Member Schultz, Marino, Narvaez, Ridley, Blackman, and Atkins. Voting against, Council Member Mendelson. With 14 voting in favor, one opposed. The motion passes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Secretary, it's my attention this time. Mayor, I'd like a moment of personal privilege, please. Um, okay, well, I'm going to give you two minutes, and then I, I really, we really need to get to our event here. So I'm going to recognize you for two minutes on a personal privilege motion, and then uh, we'll go into recess. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I was not able to complete my list, and that's a shame because very often um, we had this discussion as we were talking about this item, how transparent it was and how people were able to ask questions. And because there's a ceremony that everybody wants to rush to, we ended discussion on something of huge financial significance and importance to our city, and I um, really find that distasteful. Thank you. All right. Well, the time is now 1226, and this meeting of the Dallas City Council is now in recess. We'll reconvene at 1 p.m.